We left off last class period defining these terms. And what was that? Was that problem five that we've been working on? Problem five, the whole purpose of problem five is to make sure that you are comfortable with the top three, skip the next two, and then the next four. So it's a really good problem to get you thinking. For that problem, though, there is one complication. And you remember in class on Wednesday, I said there are some textbooks you'll find that use a different convention for work. Instead of our convention that work is the work done by the system, in which case work by system is P delta V. In that problem, it tells you that they're using the work done on the system. So for that problem, they are using a minus sign work on system is equal to P minus P delta V. So they're reversing the sign on the work. But that still doesn't change the first law's meaning of energy can't be created or destroyed. So if you change the sign of work, you have to change also the sign of work in the first law. And so for that problem, the first law of thermodynamics is delta U is equal to Q plus W. And that's why some people use it because you have the change in energy is energy added plus energy added. It, it makes sense, but the convention has always been, and so most people use delta U. Okay, I screwed that up. Delta U is equal to Q minus W, where W is the work by the system. So for that problem, you have to be adept enough to reverse the signs of work in both its definition of the first law. And if you have questions about it, anyone in this front row is totally down with it plus David. So, so those are your go-to folk. I'm checked out. Especially Anna, who has already explained it to a couple fellow students. All right. <laughs> <A -a> Anna, <laughs> we, we don't use the loser sign in this class. It's a less than. It's a less <laughs> Okay. Heat engines. Hopefully you recall from this slide here that a heat engine has one job to do. Its job is to convert thermal energy into mechanical energy. So we draw a schematic diagram for a heat engine like this. You have a hot reservoir. So TH is the temperature in the hot reservoir. You have a cold reservoir. TC is the temperature in the cold reservoir. And you have heat that flows naturally according to which law of thermodynamics tells us the direction heat's going to flow. Second. Second one. The Clausius statement says heat always flows spontaneously from hot to cold. So heat naturally flows from the hot one to the cold one if you put them in thermal contact. Now the heat engine is something we put between the hot and the cold reservoirs that's going to convert some of the thermal energy into useful mechanical work. Now notice I use the word some, not all. Another statement of the second law of thermodynamics is that it is impossible to create a heat engine that converts all of your heat you put in into useful mechanical work. That's a second statement of the second law of thermodynamics. There's lots of statements. I saw proves all people talking about the different statements and you know, this one doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, they are the same. You can derive one from any one of the others. But Carnot. <laughs> yes, that, that was the Carnot one. So a heat engine is drawn this way for a specific reason. Notice the width of this line here. It's fairly big. The width of this and the width of this should add up to equal this because you have for a complete cycle, and it's not written here, for a complete cycle of a heat engine, 
delta u equals zero. That's actually important because this internal energy is telling us about the average kinetic energy of the molecules, or in other words, it's telling us about the temperature. If delta U increased every time your engine went through a cycle, what happens to the temperature every time your engine goes through a cycle? It increases. It increases. Claudia is here. <laughs> and so your temperature would soon get too hot and you would melt everything if delta U is greater than zero for every cycle. Well, if you go the other direction, if delta U is less than zero for every cycle, what's happened to the temperature? Decreases, which means you're going to freeze your system. So in order to have a continuously running heat engine, you have to have delta U is zero for a complete cycle. And since delta U, according to the first law, is the heat added minus the work by the system, then if we look at this picture, the heat added, QH is in and QC is out. Okay, I'm up here. I don't know what you guys are watching. <laughs> so the net heat added is going to be QH minus QC. And so if delta U is zero, I have zero equals QH minus QC minus the work, which gives us this equation here. The work is equal to QH minus QC. So the work you get out is equal to the difference in the heat in and heat out. Or to put it another way, the heat in, what you put in, is equal to the work plus the exhausted heat. Now let's make a quick break to a practical heat engine. Most of us have a car somewhere around here, either that or our parents. Don't mock Max. <laughs> you still have a <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I should have brought this up. I did not say anything. No, no, you good. Okay, that car runs by burning gasoline, right? Does it run by hitting old people? That's not a <laughs> Okay, obviously everybody knows something I don't know. <laughs> okay, but... <laughs> Hi, Andy. So, our car has a heat engine. We introduce the heat at high temperature by burning the gasoline. And so that's where we get our QH, is the heat release when you burn the gasoline. And then what happens to that heat? The, the heat makes the gas in the cylinder go to very high temperature. And as a result, the pressure goes up, and that pressure makes the cylinder move. Well, if I have pressure and I have the volume increase, what do we say that's doing? Work. That's what he said, right? Very, very quietly, but yes, he said it. So that's how we're getting the energy out, because there's work done on the piston as the gas expands. But then what do we do with that gas? Okay, so what happens to the temperature as the gas expands? As it expands, it's going to decrease. So we now have cooler gas, and what do we do with that cooler gas? We give it some cool shades. Does it go in the It goes out the exhaust. <laughs> and so we had the QH was the heat released from the gas burning, and the QC is the heat that goes out the end of the exhaust pipe. And the difference in QH and QC is going to be the work that is done on that piston for our car. Now here is your first ever heat engine. Sometimes I do this in class using just a Coke can. In fact, if you look at the cover back there, I have a whole bunch of cans for this purpose. You put some water in there and you put a Bunsen burner under it and the water starts boiling. <laughs> And the water is boiling, it expands when it goes from liquid into gas, making a higher pressure. And then that pressure escapes through little holes you put on the sides, and it starts rotating, and you've now created mechanical energy. You made something useful. And so this is your first steam engine. It's, it's a 
a little cool design. Here is a, a more reasonable steam engine. Steam engine, here's the schematic diagram showing you're putting heat in at a high temperature, you're exhausting heat at a cold temperature, and you're doing mechanical work. Here's the practical part that's much more difficult. You have water in your system. You have a pump that pumps water up to the boiler. The boiler has a flame underneath, and that's introducing the heat. So you're having right here, QH is going in. And so that water becomes steam as it boils. And then that steam is allowed through a set of valves to go into this cylinder to push the cylinder back. Then you close the valve, open on the other side, and exhaust it down into a cool region where it condenses. So this is where your QH goes, or QC, I mean, QC goes. And then you heat the water up again. And so you go through this cycle of pushing that cylinder. Now, of course, the cylinder has to come back because we're only pushing it one way, right? To make that happen, we put something that we call a flywheel. A flywheel is a wheel that has a reasonably large moment of inertia. And so if you make it rotate, if it has a, a large moment of inertia, it's going to have a pretty large angular momentum. And so that angular momentum will bring it around to push the piston back out again. So you can start over. And you don't have gas in there to be compressed when it comes back. You just have the lower valve open and you push gas into the condenser region when it's coming back. So that's a practical steam engine with a reciprocating piston. Reciprocating, it goes back and forth. Another type of steam engine you can make is with a turbine rather than a reciprocating piston. A turbine is basically a windmill or a fan blade. And so you just blow air on it and the air blowing on it makes it rotate. It's a simpler design. So it's just a different variation. Um, let's, uh, you know what? Let's not use WooClap today just because this is our last thermodynamics lecture. I will put up the, uh, the next two worksheets um, by Sunday for sure. They already actually have YouTube solutions up, but I'm going to modify them a little bit, so I'll probably read you the YouTube solutions as well. And then when we get back from break on Tuesday, we have our next exam. So do we have homework due? Yes, and there, there will be homework due because it will be helping you for the test. So we're right. Still, if it wasn't helping you for the test, then I would postpone it to after the test. <clears throat> so for the test, it's 13 to 15? It's, yeah. And today is 15. Okay, so our question, what is the purpose of a heat engine? Why do we have heat engines? What's, what's their goal? Blurt. That's the purpose. That's their one job. So this is going through a more sophisticated explanation of the cycle. You have heat that comes in as high temperature steam in a steam engine. Then you have expansion. Notice this is a pressure volume diagram. So during the expansion, the pressure drops as the volume increases and it cools. And then you pump it back out. When you pump it out, this valve shifts over to here. And so when you pump it out, it goes out here to the exhaust. And so this valve has to move back and forth to control if hot steam comes in or if cool exhaust goes out. And when I say cool, that doesn't mean cool to the touch. It's a comparative. Nobody wants to touch the tailpipe in your car. That's the cold temperature reservoir, but it's going to burn you. So don't be confused about that. We analyze heat engines by looking at PV diagrams. And so you recall that the work done is pressure times change in volume, which turns out to be the area under a line. So here is the simplest <coughs> cycle you can have for a work engine for a heat engine. You have an isobaric process where you have 
the volume increase. And then you have an isochoric process where you have the pressure drop and isobaric process where the volume decreases. Actually, the, the lower one is that. This is what I'm describing. Okay, so you have the isobaric expansion, isochoric decrease in pressure, isobaric contraction, and then another isochoric pressurization. Because the network is the area under a curve, or well, the work is the area under the curve, the network for this is going to be the area under this that's positive plus the area under this. What's the area under a vertical line? I asked this question this morning. Somebody should be splurting it out. What's the area under a vertical line? Zero. Zero. And then I have this work, but because that's a contraction, that's a negative work, so I'm going to subtract the area under that, and then I have zero again. So I add this area, subtract this area. The net is what's contained inside. Now, Andy, that, I don't think that was a parallelogram for the problem. So you had to be a little more careful for calculating the area enclosed. Yeah. I spent like 45 minutes trying to calculate the area because I'm bad at geometry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get it though? No. Oh. I got an answer and it wasn't right. Oh boy. Okay, so the work done by the heat engine is the area enclosed. With our conventional definition that work is equal to P delta V, then if you have a clockwise cycle, Notice this cycle here, I've now obliterated so you can't see. This cycle has the process going clockwise. <clears throat> clockwise is doing positive work. With the conventional definition, the work is P delta V. So in this process, we can calculate that work simply enough. How much work is done going from A to B? Okay, so that's the pressure AB, which is 1.5 times 10 to the 6th pascals, newtons per meter squared is a pascal, multiplied by the change in volume, which is 500 centimeters cubed. When you look at this, you should say, uh, you got a problem. What's my problem? Units. I should convert those 500 centimeters cubed to a more standard unit. So I should convert it to meters cubed. And since one centimeter is 10 to the minus 2 meters, then centimeters cubed is 10 to the minus 2 cubed or 10 to the minus 6. You might remember me flubbing that up in an <coughs> earlier lecture. So now notice 10 to the 6 times 10 to the minus 6. What's 10 to the 6 multiplied by 10 to the minus 6? That's 0. It's 10 to the 0, which is 1. So I just have 1 and a half times 500, which is 750. Now that's how much work was done going from A to B. How much work was done going from C to D? Lead me. Zero. Not zero. From C to D is not a vertical line. Okay. I'm going to not put the negative out front. Two times 10 to the fifth pascals. I'm going to put it in here times minus 500 times 10 to the sixth meters cubed. I put it in there because the change in volume was technically negative. That's why the answer is negative. And so if I multiply those through, 2 times 500 is 1,000. But then I had 10 to the 5th times 10 to the minus 6. 
So it's a thousand times 10 minus one or 100. Minus 100 joules. And so what's the network for this cycle? 750 minus 100 is 650. Now for the last part you needed for problem five. Problem five, you're supposed to determine which shape is the shape that goes with that set of cycles. And it starts with an adiabatic process. Adiabatic always is steeper than isothermal. So it's the steeper of the two curves. Then it has an isobaric process that's decreasing volume. Isobaric decreasing volume, that's going like this. Then it has an isochoric that's increasing pressure, so it's going up. And so the important thing is to know that an isotherm is flatter and adiabatic is steeper. Now, in terms of calculating work, our geometry kind of fails if we don't have a straight line relationship between pressure and volume. And so I've given you here the actual equations for calculating the work done during an isotherm. In class, Tuesday after break, two gentlemen and I will derive this equation for the work. But it turns out it's, now look, notice I put capital N KT. What could I, I have put instead of capital N KT? I could have put two things. I could have put P initial, V initial, or NRT, or I could have put P final, V final. Um, all of those would have worked for that thing out front because according to the ideal gas law, they're the same. Then natural log of V final over V initial. That's how you calculate the work done during the isothermal process because it's not a straight line. For an adiabatic process, it's more complicated but it turns out to be a simple equation. On the top, you just have pressure final, V final, minus pressure initial, V initial, or in other words, change in parentheses pressure volume. But then you have divided by one minus gamma. And you should be, gamma is what? Well, gamma is the relationship between the molar specific heat at constant pressure and the molar specific heat at constant volume. And for monatomic ideal gas, that's five thirds. If it's not monatomic, it's gonna be something different and they would have to give you CP and CV for you to know. Because remember, depending on the temperature, if you have diatomic, what the CP and CV are gonna be. But that's a simple equation for calculating the work done in each of those cycles, or in each of those processes, excuse me. So why do I give these to you? So you can calculate works. What do we call a process where there is no heat flow? Once again, just blurt. Adiabatic. Just before class, I looked it up to make sure. And yeah, it's a Greek word that means that it cannot pass. You can't have heat pass is what that means. Oh, I really, really wanted to show this video. It's totally cool. Come on, open Sesame. Probably going to open seven times now. San Diego, California. October 2010. A fighter jet roars across the sky. Suddenly, there's a burst of light surrounding the wings. The crowds watch in amazement. This isn't an engine malfunction, and the jet isn't about to explode. By slowing the footage down, this amazing vision becomes clear. As the plane approaches the speed of sound, it is momentarily engulfed by a blast of cloud. This is strange weather at its fastest. Meteorologist Steph Golton explains exactly how this bizarre cloud is formed. 
to form a sonic boom cloud, you need two things really. You need a lot of moisture in the air and you also need a plane travelling really, really fast. As the plane is hurtling along and getting faster and faster, the air ahead of the wing is all becoming really compressed, but behind it is all stretching out and that allows the pressure here to drop. That allows the air to expand and as it expands, it cools and that cooling allows the water vapour to condense and that's why the cloud forms. It's the sudden change in pressure from high to low that creates this cloud formation. Steph demonstrates exactly how this pressure change works. So we can imagine this to be our atmosphere then and inside we've got some air and we've also got some moisture as well. Now we can pretend that this is our atmosphere around the plane and we can show that going from high pressure to low pressure creates a sonic boom cloud. Now, I've only got two hands, so I'm going to need a little bit of help in order to make the pressure here a lot higher. Now this is what happens ahead of the wing. The air is all being compressed, but suddenly as the air passes over the wing, the high pressure goes to low pressure and you've got a cloud. Former Navy fighter pilot Pete Ross has witnessed the sonic boom cloud firsthand. It's really the shock wave that's created by the winds that is going to create that conical vapor cloud. So somewhere aft of here, you know, if you drew a circle around this airplane, uh, including the wingspan, the big disc would be back here, and it may blank out the entire aft end of the airplane. It's just spectacular. I mean, it's a, it's a man-made phenomenon. There is nothing in nature. You never walk around and see a, a spontaneously induced shockwave cloud. So it seems that even a plane can trigger strange weather events. Okay, you missed the best part of class. <laughs> so, why did I have this video here? Because we learned about rates of heating and cooling in chapter 14. And so we had for conduction, the rate Q over delta T is you know, K times the area over the length multiplied by the temperature difference. The whole key to that is not the equation right now, but the fact that there is a rate of heating. The heat does not travel instantaneously. It takes some time. And so with this airplane, you have the shock wave is going to create a low pressure region. So the pressure goes from high pressure to low pressure really quickly. Well, what happens when pressure drops really quickly according to PV equals NRT? P drops and V stays the same, what's T have to do? If, if P drops really quickly and V stays the same, then what is temperature going to do? It's going to drop quickly. So the temperature drops really quickly, and there's not time for heat to flow in to, to keep the temperature from dropping. So if there's not time for heat, what do we call that kind of process? It's an adiabatic. I had a teacher to call the idiot bat, and I was thinking that idiot all the time when he was talking about this. Um, so you have an adiabatic cooling process there. And so it cools very rapidly. And you recall when we talked about humidity, that the amount of moisture that the air can hold is very temperature dependent. Hot air can hold a lot more moisture than cold air. So you have air that is not saturated, that means your humidity is less than 100%, and suddenly the pressure drops, and with it the temperature drops rapidly, the amount of moisture it can hold then drops rapidly, so it has less, or it has more moisture than the air can hold. And when you have more moisture than the air can hold, what happens? You have condensation, and so you form little droplets of water in the air, and that's the cloud. And so what you were seeing there was Droplets form right after the shock wave because of that rapid drop in pressure resulting in the rapid drop in temperature because it was an adiabatic process. 
So it's, I think, really cool to be able to explain this. Now, when you see a jet flying overhead, you see a trail that it leaves. What do we call those trails? Contrails. One of my high school classmates, he's a dentist, he's well educated, he's taken this class. He called it a Kim trail, and I was going to, on Facebook, like 10 years ago, and I was going to write and say, oh, that's called a contrail. <coughs> and then I found that there are people who believe that those are experiments being done by the government to change the weather, and they're putting chemicals into the, uh, the exhaust, they're putting in the fuel so it comes out in the exhaust to make those. And so they call them Kim trails, it's a big conspiracy. And I mean, I can't deny that contrails exist because I don't have any evidence for it. But I can't say that contrails do exist because of the same thing. You might have noticed in one of the pictures they showed, at the ends of the wings, you were leaving behind a contrail. It's not where the engines were. So it had nothing to do with the jet engines that was leaving those trails. What you had at the end were little canister-like things at the ends of the wings that were causing a bigger shock wave that was causing a more decompression, lower temperature drop, and causing condensation there. And so that's the, the standard cause of a contrail. Seriously, what are you guys doing? Okay, I know what she's doing. I was like, it's like a contrail. <laughs> okay, at least it's relevant. I talked about a car engine earlier. A car engine is a simple example of a heat engine. And so the car engine runs on what is conveniently enough called the auto cycle. Now notice this is not automobile auto, it's auto, O-T-T-O, based on the German dude who came up with this cycle. But this is the cycle for a car engine. Car engines are called four-stroke engines. <laughs> If this is a bad day, they're sitting there listening to their music. <laughs> they're listening to music, you're watching videos, I'm trying to teach. <laughs> okay, so the auto cycle is the cycle used by a four-stroke engine. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, I was wondering why do we have two stroke and four stroke engines and what's the difference? Anybody ever wondered that? Two strokes, two strokes are in motorcycles. Why? I don't know. It's, it's a fundamentally different cycle that they're using. So here's the four stroke cycle. First, you have intake. What's going on with the intake? The piston is moving down. And you have these valves here. You open this valve so the air flows in. And so it's just what you think. The piston goes down. Why is the piston going to go down? No, no, what's going to make it go down? You have that flywheel. The flywheel is what's pulling it down. And so it's pulling in air. Now, I don't think I ever got to do this problem in class. I'm not sure. But I worked out a whole problem with a dragster for class. And when I was doing that, I was looking at, you know, dragster engine specs. They use 900 horsepower for their supercharger to blow air in. They blow air in at three atmospheres. Now, if you think about that, 900 horsepower, how many horsepower does your car engine have? Not counting you, Max. <laughs> how many horsepower does a car engine have? Somewhere around... Yeah, somewhere in the ballpark of 200 horses. Depends on your car, obviously. 900 horsepower for the blower on those things. They're using, they're using basically four times the amount of power my car produces just to push air in during that intake cycle. So how much power is actually in this thing? It's like somewhere in the ballpark of 6,000 horses. Okay, so that's our first cycle, intake. Then we have compression. Now the piston is compressing that gas. Once again, the flywheel is pushing the piston up to compress the gas. Notice both of these valves are now closed. The valves are really important to your car because they're controlling the flow of gases in and out of the piston. So what's going to happen to the temperature of the gas when it gets compressed? 
it's going to get increased. So this is going to be hot. And then you have the spark. The spark is you have a spark plug in an automobile engine that ignites the gasoline. The burning gasoline heats up when it heats up. Temperature rise causes pressure increase. So now you have a really hot, high pressure gas. And now you have finally the power cycle is this coming down and driving now the engine, making that flywheel turn to put the energy in for the rest of the process, as well as making the car go down the road. And then the final step, you open up the exhaust valve and you blow your gas out of the exhaust. All the black triangles, the flywheel movement. Um, that yes, that's correct. Well, yes. I was going to say this was purple, but that's my right. Yes, all the black ones are the flywheel is doing, is making it happen. What's the red one? The red one is the gas is making it happen. So that's where we're getting our work out, is the red one. Now, some things that are, I, I think it's important to have some idea of how a car engine works, just so you can walk around and be, you know, better than the people around you. I know you're already better, but... What's missing in this picture? This is the way the picture was when I was your age, but now they have fuel injectors. Back when I was your age, we had carbureted engines. In high school, I rebuilt the carburetor. The carburetor is mixing fuel and air because to have combustion, you have to have the right ratio of fuel and air. The carburetor is responsible for that. Nowadays, they use fuel injectors. So you just have something that puts a spray of fuel right into your piston instead of having the fuel in the air that comes in. So that's what a fuel injector is as opposed to carburation. What about the drain injector? Same thing. What was that? I don't want to hear it. Can you tell me what the drain I don't want to hear what, it. What is? The drain injector. I do not know the term. I got you. Sorry. So what's this? The I don't know anymore. Oh, <laughs> so that's not shown here. What's the difference in a supercharger, a turbocharger, and not having either one? Mine doesn't have either either. Most of us don't have one. Yeah, Max, you don't have one either. You don't. I do, did. Used to. <laughs> he used to did. I had a turbo. Oh. <laughs> okay, so. A supercharger or a turbocharger are things that are going to blow the air in. So you can get basically more oxygen in there, a little higher pressure you're going to result. And a turbocharger is using the engine to do it. It's using the engine to blow the fuel. So you're taking some of your power to put it in there. A supercharger is running off a battery and using that to run a fan to blow it in. So a supercharger is working efficiently at low RPM or high RPM. A turbocharger works better at high RPM, not so well at low. I think you've got it backwards. I don't think so. Sorry, Question, Sarah. Why is that like no, NOS? NOS is a nitrous oxide system. That's the thing that like, makes it incredibly fast, right? Isn't it like nitrous yeah, oxide, like nitrous oxide will deliver more energy when you burn it than gasoline. Why do they run <laughs> <laughs> because it tears your engine apart. Yes. Wait, does that actually feel like when they show it in movies and everything and their cars are all pristine, it's fake? Well, it's the, fake. the engine, if you use the nitrous oxide for very long, your engine's going to get too hot. It's going to be all kinds of damage. So they do it for very short bursts. Oh, straight to <laughs> Okay, so I don't know why we got on that. That was not what I intended to do. But hey, it has to do with heat engines and making them work. One more thing that I think is kind of cool to know. How do we determine what fuel to put in our car? Okay, by what the car manual says. But the car manual says something like, tell me what it says. Unleaded only. Okay, unleaded only. I'm old enough that there were gas with lead in it. Lead was used as a lubricant. They put it in the gas, it lubricates the cylinder. <laughs> makes the engine last better. But unfortunately, then you're also putting lead in your exhaust, and that's bad for the environment. 
Um, so ever since somewhere around the late 70s, unleaded fuel has been banned, or leaded fuel has been banned. So it's all unleaded. What else? Okay, diesel. Yeah, I have my sister's father-in-law. Um, although in his case, it wasn't as much his fault. It should have a green handle if it's diesel pump. And if it doesn't have a green handle on the diesel pump, you're going to have people make mistakes. And you probably have seen the meme, be eco-friendly. Put the eco-friendly dash in your car. No, that's diesel. Okay, so diesel is a different energy content. If you put diesel in a gasoline engine, you're going to gum it up. If you put gas in a diesel engine, it's not good for it, but it's not going to destroy it. Um, okay, so gas versus diesel, different fuels. Ethanol. Okay, ethanol versus non-ethanol, and what do you say? I think you said octane or something in that regard. So ethanol versus regular gasoline. What's the difference there? Corn starch. Corn starch. The ethanol is made from corn. Supposedly greener. It gives you less energy for your buck. The, the government helps supplement it. Because ethanol is something that we can easily produce. It's a renewable energy source. It's not as good as gasoline. Octane is the one I wanted to get to. I hate it when I go on these long things that are important physics, but not what we're going to have test questions on. <laughs> the octane, you guys, how many people have taken general chemistry? Okay, and you have to have, have a nomenclature quiz, and you have to learn what octane means, right? What does octane mean? Oh, eight. Eight. Eight what? I forgot about the carbons. Eight carbons with? A single bond. Single bond, okay, there we go, that's what octane means. Eight carbon chains with a single bond. The octane measurement originally was a measurement of what percentage of the chains were longer or shorter than, than eight. What it is in practice is a measurement of how quickly the gasoline burns. Now you guys are taking probably organic chemistry. Which should burn quicker, methane or octane? Methane. Methane. So the octane burns slower, the methane burns faster. If you have a high octane gas, it's gonna burn more slowly. A low octane gas will burn more rapidly. What difference does that make in your car? When that spark fires, then you have the gas burn. If it burns super rapidly, you have a really high punch of pressure. If it burns more slowly, it's spread out. And so it's going to be a little easier on the engine if it burns slowly than if it has that high punch. So that's really the difference in the octanes. What else would affect how quickly your gas burns? How much are you using? How fast? How much are you using? How fast? What I'm going with is I'm going to Colorado in 10 minutes. The amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. If you have lower pressure, you're going to have less oxygen that you're getting in there, and that's going to make it burn more slowly. And so, not better gas mileage, in fact, it's, I don't know, probably a little worse. But they, they sell 85 octane there in Colorado, whereas they sell 87 octane here. Because the 85 octane is going to burn more slowly there. So it's going to behave more like 87 octane would here. Okay. So the auto cycle is an adiabatic expansion. That's a constant temperature expansion. What's constant temperature about it? The gas is burning at the temperature the gas burns. And then you have... Um, exhaust, then you have an adiabatic compression, and then you have, um, actually, yeah, then you have the pressure go up. That's actually as it burns there is the pressure going up. I said that wrong. So the heat is flowing in right here. So this is when your spark is. This is your power. This is your exhaust. And so that's how the auto cycle works. Now, that is not the only cycle. And Saudi Carnot theorized the ideal cycle. 
the ideal engine would have an isothermal expansion while heat goes in. So constant temperature, heat goes in. Then an adiabatic expansion. No heat flows in or out, and it expands. Then you have an isothermal exhaust. Heat goes out at constant temperature, and an adiabatic compression. What's ideal about this? He was able to show mathematically that this will give you the highest efficiency possible if your heat at high temperature comes in at TH and your heat at low temperature comes out at TC. And furthermore, he was able to show that for the Carnot cycle, whoops, didn't mean to do that, QH is proportional to TH and QC is proportional to TC. That's not always true. That's true for this cycle. Why is that important? Efficiency. Efficiency calculation is how much you get out divided by how much you put in. So for a heat engine, what are you putting in? You're putting in heat at high temperature. So what you're putting in is QH. So QH is going to be the thing on the bottom because that's what you get out. Or that's what you put on me. What are you getting out of your heat engine? Work. But work is the thing you want. You have the waste, but we don't want the waste. So that's your efficiency. It's what you get out that you want to divide by what you put in. Well, for a heat engine, we had work was equal to QH minus QC. So this here that I've written in purple is true for any, on the left what I've written in purple is true for any heat engine. But for the Carnot engine, since Q is proportional to temperature, efficiency is equal to one minus, and I replace temperature or Q cold with temperature cold and Q hot with temperature hot. And so for the Carnot engine, this equation here becomes that. And so if you know what the two temperatures are, you can calculate the efficiency. And the, the idea behind the Carnot engine, it's not a real engine. You can't make one of these that work. It would have to be reversible, which means you have to run it at an infinitesimal speed, which means it takes take an infinite amount of time to do one cycle. I've seen people say, oh, yes, I've seen Carnot engines. No, you haven't. They don't exist. But it's a theoretical engine that tells you what the best possible efficiency would be. So what's the point of a Carnot engine? Gives you a theoretical efficiency, so that's your target. As you make a real engine, if you're like at 50% of Carnot efficiency, you say, well, I could probably optimize. If you're 90% of Carnot, good golly, you have a great engine, even if your Carnot efficiency is 25%. Question, Andy. Um, I thought the book was saying that drinking was a Carnot engine, is it saying it's like the closest to a Carnot engine, or that it's not because it doesn't do any work? Um, I don't know what it said, but it does do work. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's not a Carnot engine. Okay. Okay, um, this is, I'll, I'll skip over this for now. That's how we have electric power generation using a steam oh, generator. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what I can cover in the amount of time. Well, yeah, nothing. We did not talk about heat pumps, refrigerators. Heat pumps or refrigerators are just heat engines run in reverse. So if we look at this picture here, if it was a refrigerator, all arrows reverse. So you still have all the same rules. But efficiency... <laughs> We don't talk about the efficiency of a heat pump because a heat pump isn't converting A into B. Instead, we talk about the coefficient of performance. And that's the thing we want out of it. If you want an air conditioner, what's the thing you care about? Q high, Q cold, or work? Uh, cold. Q cold, right. You want to pump cool, you want to pump heat out of your house at the lower temperature. So for a refrigerator, it's going to be the Q cold divided by what you put in is the work. That's the coefficient of performance. 
And the coefficient of, the coefficient of performance can be well over one. Likewise for heating. The coefficient of performance for a heat pump and heating can be well over one. The best you'll ever get if you have something that's like electricity going through a coil is one, converting the electricity into heat. So heat pump will always outperform your little radiant or, you know, electric heater, no matter what they say in the back of magazines. Okay. Have a great Thanksgiving, y'all. Thank <laughs> you.